So thankful to be here with you today uh, as we continue our Running on Empty series that Joel started last week. My name's Ryan. I am the executive pastor here at Harbor. I, uh, for, for, for months, if it's, if it's your first time with us, welcome home. We're thankful that you joined us. If you've been around for a while, you know how much I dislike the term executive pastor. But I've just decided today, from, from now on, from this point forward, I'm going to own it. And I was talking to one of our deacons, his name's Colby. He might be watching online with us. Uh, If you're here with us, Colby, anyone else watching online, we're thankful that you've joined us today. Uh, But we were talking on Thursday. I sent out an email on Tuesday to the church, uh, just giving updates on the capacity campaign, the ways that your generosity has made a tangible difference uh, from local families uh, who who have been impacted by our infant classroom opening up uh, a few months ago. Uh, to global needs being met through, through Casa de la Esperanza. Your, your money has gone to support them. Uh, Sahar and One Heart in Greece, uh, the Crandals in Thailand, and our new youth pastor who is just straight up crushing it, uh, Stone Man, love Camp Maranatha, all the cool things that have happened because of your generosity. But what, what Colby pointed out is, is some of the unseen ways uh, that your giving has, has enabled things to move and shift as a church. Uh, just for me personally, I didn't have to go to camp. <laughs> and uh, I love students, I love kids, but, but praise God, I was so happy that I was not covered with mud in a stinky room filled with boys. I got to be home with my wife and my own stinky children. I think we went camping that weekend, it was awesome. Uh, we've also been able to take ground as a church as we have grown. Uh, we, we've sort of shifted from a church where everybody knows everyone to a church where everyone is known. And as, as things grow, there are behind the scenes things, systems, small groups, group studies, life groups that have to grow and shift and take place. As, as you have been more generous, there, there's uh, financial aspects of the church that we have to be intentional about covering. And so I've been able to focus on some of those things with our, with our board members, our staff, our deacons. Uh, and, and so there's some cool things that you're gonna see, more life groups, more group studies, uh, more intentionality in some of the things that we do. And, and so those things excite me. And so I'm just gonna own from now on being the executive pastor. I'm excited about it. Thank you for your generosity. And uh, thank you for being here today. Uh, like I said, as we continue our, our Running on Empty series, and I'm excited about this series uh, as we have, uh, mainly for my, myself, uh, if not for you guys also, I, as Joel talked about last week, we just sort of sense a collective exhaustion in people. Uh, as if people are, are running on empty. Really in the season where we're all supposed to, supposed to be excited and enjoying a break from school, there's, there's a little bit of burnout, fatigue, and uh, exhaustion. And as I think about why that is, you know, Joel unpacked some of that last week. We're gonna talk today about uh, the emotion that I think is, is maybe primarily responsible for some of our burnout and our fatigue and our, and, and our tiredness. It's, it's anxiety, anxiety. I think at the root of, of a lot of what we deal with when it comes to being tired uh, is that we are anxious, worried, fearful, stressed out, burned out, uh, and, and just sick of it all. And, and if you were to ask me when I came to Harbor two and a half years ago, right before the pandemic started, if you'd have asked me if I was an anxious person, I would have told you confidently, no. Like I, I'm a laid back guy. I, I don't feel like I, I stress out a whole lot. I, I'm not too high or too low. It's hard to get me excited about anything, but it's also harder to get me nervous about much, or at least I thought. Uh, and then we moved here in January of 2020, right before the pandemic. And we, we, we moved back closer to family around all of you wonderful people, but we didn't know a whole lot of you two and a half months in when, when the world shut down. And uh, I can remember uh, the, just how crazy that time was. I don't know what your experience was, but I just remember, right? I'm two and a half months in at a new job, just getting to know Joel, Jordan, the rest of the staff, all these wonderful people, all of you. And uh, all of a sudden I can't see anyone in person, right? And my wife who had just gotten a part-time job uh, had that job ended because uh, the hospitals were closed down, which is where she works. And so we didn't know what we were gonna do. We didn't know what the future looked like. We didn't know what was gonna happen with COVID. And so uh, there was just sort of this anxiety that developed in me. In fact, I'd argue Uh, based on what we've all experienced, that we live in a culture marked by constant crushing anxiety. Think about what's happened in the past couple of years because it it never really stopped, did it? We went from shelter at home, COVID, changing right disease protocols to the racism uh, of the summer of 2020, George Floyd, and all the other things that happened right into a contentious election season where, uh, where things were just completely 
completely calm between Trump and Biden and there were, there were no issues whatsoever, right? And, and uh, we had the second wave of COVID and then 2021 didn't get any easier because we had January 6th, right? And we had Afghanistan and we had supply chain disruptions and then we had the third wave of the vaccine and, and then we are the third wave of COVID and then we had to deal with vaccines and masking issues it just never stopped, did it? And then last, last fall, we began to see the hints of inflation. And, and then when COVID started to decline, right, we came into 2022. And, and now we have gas prices that are so high, everybody hates driving now. And, and we have inflation that's, that's through the roof, right? And, and we have Russia invading Ukraine. And we have gun violence and abortion issues. And we have another election that we have to deal with. And it just never stops, does it? And I'm not sure that it ever will. We just live in a world uh, of constant upheaval, constant turmoil, constant crushing anxiety. There are always pressures on us. There are always things that we have to accomplish. We're always worried about money. We're always worried about what's going to happen in the world and how that's going to impact us. We're worried about what other people think. And what happens in our lives is this, constant crushing anxiety inevitably leads to a rhythm of relentless productivity. Here's how I responded when all of that was going on early on in the, uh, the pandemic. I began to just work really, really hard. And uh, uh, I, I worked nonstop. I, my job title actually changed. I, I became the online pastor, not the associate pastor, and, uh, uh, which is ironic because it, you probably won't meet a person who just hates social media more than I do. Like, uh, I, I, I dislike all of it, but I even learned how to use TikTok back in the day. I never learned how to actually post a video on TikTok because nobody wants to watch that. Uh, but uh, I, I learned every type of social media. I became the online pastor. I was constantly plugged in, constantly connected, constantly doing things. I, if, if I wasn't working, I was worrying and, about what was going on. I was reading about things so I could stay up to date. There was never a break. It was just on and on and on, constant, constant. And when you're, when, you're, when you're going that hard, how many of you know it's hard to shut your brain off when it's time to sleep? And so you overwork, you're relentlessly productive, but then your relentless productivity actually makes it so you, your mind runs when you're trying to sleep. Anybody else deal with this in the past two and a half years? It's crushing, right? It's difficult. And uh, I'd love to tell you, I think at various times I've sort of taken a breather and stepped back, but I don't know that I've, I've ever fully reset from these rhythms of, of overworking. Uh, of doom scrolling, of being constantly plugged in, of staying concerned and connected to what's going on, of, of when I reach the point of exhaustion, of, of binge watching TV or binge eating. I know it may not look like I binge eat, but sometimes I do just to deal with the stress, right? Relentless productivity is the result of all this. And I don't think that any of this is new. It, it may be more intensified for us today, right? constant crushing anxiety that inevitably leads to rhythms of relentless productivity. It, it may be a little bit more intense, but I think it's always been this way. The world has always worked this way. And, and Jesus offers us in his Sermon on the Mount some ways that we can overcome this. He also reveals why we do this. Why are we prone to live this way? He shows us that in, in Matthew chapter six, if you wanna turn there, we're gonna look at the Sermon on the Mount. And, and he also gives us the way that we can overcome this. And in Matthew chapter six, it's right after what we talked about in the last series, alternate routes, the Beatitudes, is how Jesus opens his most famous message in Matthew chapter five. In Matthew chapter six, he continues and talks about a variety of things, fasting, praying, giving. And we're gonna pick it up in, in verse uh, 19 of chapter six. And he talks a little bit about giving here. He says this, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is, in, is darkness, how great is the darkness? No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. 
are you not of more value than they? And which of you by being anxious can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is to lie alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. 2,000 years ago, Jesus spoke those words to a group of people who were stressed out, anxious, constantly trying to prove themselves to, to appear as if they had it all together. His, I, I love his analogies. I think they're just so timeless for us, moth and rust and, and birds and, and trees. There's a, there's a natural focus there, right? But, but I also wonder too if, it, it, and I sometimes wonder this with parables and with some of Jesus' illustrations in his messages, if he might've spoken things a little bit differently for us so that it would ha pack a little bit more of a punch. Like, I think they would've, this is probably the most impactful thing that he could have said to them. You know, most of their possessions weren't wrapped up in the, 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 the little numbers on a screen that, that showed what their bank account was worth or the amount of money that was in their IRA. It was really based on the, the land and the animals that they owned and, and, and some of the possessions, the clothes that they would pass on. It's weird to think about this, but styles didn't fade in and out. And so the way you would pass on possessions was through the furniture that you own made of metal and wood, different materials, and, and the clothing, the intricate, hand-woven, authentic, really, really, really expensive clothing that you would pass on from generation to generation that, that showed that you were a, a worthy person and had something to give to the next generation. But all of this stuff, right, is open to the elements. We don't really pass on furniture today though, or clothing, do we? I think we, we often find our value in uh, things like, I, I think Jesus might've said something about how, about tech devices, right? These plastic things that we place so much value in that we stare at constantly uh, that, that ironically don't, don't really degrade, uh, are kind of around for hundreds, if not thousands of years, while simultaneously losing their, almost 100% of their value in five to seven years, right? Isn't that ironic? I mean, the, uh, or, or the fact, right, that, that we place so much value in, in what our bank account says or in what our IRA is worth when, I mean, if, if, if you're like anyone else, you're, it's probably lost at least 20% of its value. And that's if you were in the stock market, not cryptocurrency, right? I mean, because you probably lost more than that. The, uh, it's, it's just open to the whims of a few rich, wealthy men who decide, and women who decide to, to invest or not, right? The, I, I think you would have pointed out these ironies. And, and rather than intricate clothing, I think Jesus might have said something about how obsessed we are with our bodies, how, how much security we get from, from being healthy and, and how, how some of us are so intensely anal about what we eat and about how often we work out and, and about really mental, mental health and wellness. And, and we miss the fact that right, birds and flowers go around uh, just arrayed in beauty and they don't spend a second worried about it. I think Jesus might have pointed some of these things out. And it's as we look at these things that, that we realize what the problem is. See, we struggle with constant crushing anxiety, which leads to a rhythm of relentless productivity because we find safety, security, and significance in things that are temporary. That's what Jesus is getting at. We find safety, security, and significance in things that are temporary. Our safety is based upon our health. That's why COVID was so hard for many of us because the thought that we might lose our health, that we might, we might lose our ability to care for ourselves is, is truly frightening. We find security in the amount of money in our bank accounts and in the things that we own. And when that's threatened to be taken away from us, whether we lose jobs or the stock market crashes, we begin to feel anxious. We find significance in the opinions of others and what they think of us. And so anytime that's threatened, and it can be threatened in a moment today, uh, it makes us anxious. We find safety, security, and significance in things that are temporary. And, and there's, a, there's a deeper, more insidious truth here for us as we reflect on this, as we think about why we're anxious. 
And it's revealed in what Jesus says at the beginning of the passage when he says uh, that, that we can't serve two masters. In verse 24, he says, no one can serve two masters for he, would either, he will either hate the one and love the other or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You can't serve God and possessions. You can't serve God and money. You must either seek God's kingdom first or you must build your own. You can't do both. It's either about you or it's about him. And, and, and the truth that's revealed as Jesus says these words is this. Our anxiety is a sign that we are practical atheists, even though we might say we believe in God. We, might, we honor God with our lips, but our hearts often are far from him, particularly when we're anxious. And uh, if you disagree with me, I stole that line from a, uh, I stole that line from a commentary, a, a guy who's far smarter than me. So he's the one who came up with the practical atheism quote. And this one's from Francis Chan. Uh, that, that goes along the same lines. Worry implies this. Worry implies that we don't quite trust God is big enough, powerful enough, or loving enough to, care, to take care of what's happening in our lives. When we are anxious, what we are saying is that we don't believe that God truly is who he says he is, that he'll do what he says he can do, and that he'll take care of what he says he'll take care of. Right? God is so glorious and wonderful and true. Uh, but we are so quick to forget it. We are so often practical atheists in the way that we live. And, and this is a, a constant, never-ending, soul-sucking battle, isn't it? It's a battle every day to fight fear. It's a battle every day to fight anxiety. It's a battle every day to fight the stresses that inevitably come upon our lives because even though we are called to seek God's kingdom first, even though we are called to live for him, we have to live in a world that functions on social currencies like money and the opinions of others uh, and work. We, we, I think that all of us would probably agree with this statement in reality, right? Or at least in our minds. And this is what Jesus is pointing out. God takes care of our needs. God takes care of our needs and he offers us joy-filled peace that leads to rhythms of rest as we find safety and security in the kingdom of God and significance in Christ's righteousness. This is what we're offered. And every one of us, I think, knows this is true. We know that God takes care of our needs. We know that when we trust him and serve him and honor him, that he takes care of, not, what we, not always what we want, right? He may not give us the big house, right? As Joel likes to talk about, the prosperity gospel really isn't a thing. That's not who, who God is. But he gives us what we need. And he gives us peace that surpasses understanding. He offers us a life of rest in him, even as we work hard, even as we strive, he gives us those things and we are safe and secure in his arms and we are significant, not because of what we accomplish in this world, but because of who we become and how we become like Jesus. I mean, think about it, right? We, we know this is true. We think about the future that we have in Jesus, the fact that one day he will return in glory and that he will draw us to himself, those who believe in his son and who have given their lives to him by grace through faith. And we are promised an, an imperishable inheritance. Nothing can take us from his arms. We are completely safe in the loving arms of Jesus. And there's nothing that can separate us from his love. We will one day have everything we desire in this life and the next. Constant communion with God. We will never experience sickness, sin, or death again. We will live for eternity in his presence. And, and our significance is found not in what we do, but in who we become, how we live before Jesus, in adopting Jesus' righteousness. Significance is not found in what we accomplish, but in how we live for him and love like him and, and serve him. But all of this is really pie in the sky stuff, isn't it? I mean, the daily, the daily things that we deal with are constant, they're crushing. And, and, and I think that we need to recognize something as we talk about this. We often just work on trying harder and when that doesn't work, we check out. But there's a, there's a central truth that, that is revealed throughout scripture and is really the central message of this series. God reorients our affections through rhythms. God reorients our affections through rhythms. 
Look at the, look at the, the, the span of scripture. When God, when God rescues the Israelites from backbreaking slavery in Egypt that was started by a Pharaoh who was experiencing anxiety, right? The whole system was, was really marked by, by fear-inducing, constant crushing anxiety and a rhythm of relentless productivity. They never got days off. It always got harder. It always got worse. And when God took them out of Israel, he rescued them from slavery. He saved them. What's the first thing that God did? He took them to a mountain and he gave them new, a new ethic, new rhythms to live by. He, he said, you shall not have any other gods before me. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. He gave eight negative commandments out of the 10 and tucked in the middle was something that held them together. The longest commandment was actually about honoring the Sabbath. They were called to, take a, to have a rhythm of rest in their lives so that they could follow God. They were to be marked by rest. God gave them a rhythm so that they would learn how to not be slaves to fear and, and slaves to productivity. Later on when, in, in the gospels, Jesus invited people who were stressed out and, and, in, and, and really filled with fear, constantly working to prove themselves to other people. He said, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. He invited them to, to take on Jesus's yoke. Essentially, right, a yoke ties you to someone else. And so Jesus was asking people to adopt his, his rhythms and his lifestyle. That's what Jesus was doing when he said, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. Adopt my rhythm, allow me to carry the burden for you. And later on, it doesn't stop there. This is how God works. He, re, he redefines our rhythms. When, when Jesus left his disciples, he, the last thing he did with them was institute a rhythm of communion because we're so prone to forget, right? We're crushed by the weight of the world. We constantly forget what God has called us to. And so we have to have rhythms that reorient our affections. We take communion once a month because we're so prone to forget who Jesus is. And, and later on, it didn't stop there. The first thing the early church did was they instituted a rhythm of baptism. Why? Because we need these reminders in our lives. We, we need these, the, these sort of foundational points that we can, we can remember and point back to, to, to remind us of who we are. And, and what's revealed in this passage, if we, can, if we can interpret this passage through the lens of rhythms, uh, I, I think Jesus would tell us this, God reorients our affections through rhythms surrounding our possessions and attention. God reorients our affections through rhythms surrounding our our possessions and attention. There's some interesting things that Jesus says here in regards to this. In the beginning of the passage, right, verse 21, he says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. What you do with your time, we, we, we call it the attention economy for a reason, right? Where your eyes go determines what, what is valuable and what you'll spend money on. Where your time goes, where your treasure goes, your money, your possessions, where you place your talent reorients what you are affectionate about, what you're passionate about. And the same thing is true of our attention. He goes on. I don't fully understand what verse 22 and 23 mean, just to be completely honest. Uh, but he, he talks there about, about the eye. I think that's significant, right? The eye is the lamp of the body. What you focus on determines what you're affectionate about. And just two examples. I, I feel like not only have I switched jobs, I've, I've sort of made the transition into middle age uh, because my, my affections have changed. I used to love basketball. I'm too short, skinny, and slow to actually be any good at it, but I love playing the game and talking about the game, and it's fun for me. Uh, but every time that I go play, I get hurt. And uh, this is a recent thing. I tore a tendon in my pinky. I sprained my ankle. I hurt myself all the time. I get made fun of constantly for these things by my so-called friends and my wife. And uh, my wife's a little kinder than my friends. Uh, but uh, so I've decided that I, I've just given up. I have taken up two old man activities, uh, pickleball and gardening. So... Yes. So this summer, this summer, I, uh, I have fallen in love with pickleball and gardening. I go play and, and uh, actually, I actually convinced a group of guys here to play with me. So, uh, and they enjoy it too. Guys my age, I couldn't believe it, man. I'm shocked. If you want to play with me, let me know. Play with us. It's awesome. But we go once a week. Uh, it's been super fun. I never thought I'd love it, but uh, I've given my time to it. I've actually watched professional pickleball tournaments. These things exist. 
I, uh, I've watched training videos on YouTube about how to play this. I bought a nice racket. And so what you, and I just love it. I love it. My wife gets mad at me. She's like, she's like, this is all you want to do. And uh, I, I want to do it with you. But uh, I also want to, I also want to play it. It's fun, right? Like what we give our attention and what we spend our money on changes uh, what we are affectionate about. The same thing with gardening, right? I just decided this year I was sick of looking at brown spots and sick of killing things. So I did the same thing. Started watching videos. Uh, I spent hours on my sprinkler system. I have no dead spots in my yard. Praise God. Uh, I'm so excited. Uh, ask me in two weeks after the, really, after the heat really starts, but my flowers are beautiful. I put miracle Grow on my flowers on Friday. Come on. The, uh, this, is how, this is how pathetic it is. But our affections change based on what we do with our possessions and what we do with our attention. And, and this, is, this is so true in these two areas, possessions and attention. Generosity does something in us. It's amazing what it, what it does. There's scientific studies that back this up. And I'm gonna say these things in, in first person language because I, I want you to envision yourself living this out. Most of you probably already do. I'm, maybe I'm the one that, that struggles with it, but here's the deal. Generosity cures my anxiety. Generosity cures my anxiety. It's sort of counterintuitive. I actually wasn't gonna start today's message in verse 19. I was gonna start it in verse 25. Some of you wished I probably would when I kept reading for like a minute and a half. But, but uh, whenever there's a therefore, in verse 20, 25, there's a therefore. And when, when you find a therefore in scripture, you have to figure out what it's there for. So I had to go back and read. And, and what I realized, I never would have included this in a message on anxiety, but generosity actually cures my anxiety. I, I remember, I love camps, but one of the things I realized that was as valuable as camps was taking kids on mission trips. We lived in Arizona for about 10 years and we would go to, to, to reservations, Indian reservations around the state. And you wouldn't believe the poverty. It's sort of like going to Mexico in a number of ways. I think we visited seven or eight different reservations. And uh, one of the things that shocked me is, is when we would take a group of students to, a, to a, a really almost a third world country in some ways. I mean, it's, it's, it's like being in a different culture in many ways. Uh, we take them there, no cell phone service, sleeping on the floor, oftentimes in a building that didn't seem safe, that didn't have it all together. I'd watch these, probably the most anxious group of people, uh, age group in, in the world. Uh, I'd watch them live with joy and laugh and play and not complain about not being able to get on their phones. It, it was phenomenal to me. Generosity actually cured the, their anxiety in a way that I never anticipated. And just a quick story about a kid. We had a kid go on this, uh, go on a trip uh, who was particularly struggling with anxiety. And uh, he decided as we were there, he, he sensed God's voice calling him to go on a mission trip to Africa. And, uh, but, but something happened in between the time God called him and the time that he got. He'd been saving for a, a camera. He was a, a wonderful photographer. He had over a thousand dollars saved and he believed that God was calling him to take all those funds all those funds, generosity with his, his time led to generosity with his possessions. And he began to do these things. And, but he had this experience. He was driving his car. He was, he was 17 years old. And he had a guy pull a gun on him and, and try to steal his car. It didn't work out, but it traumatized him. He was filled with anxiety, right? Crushing. He couldn't stop thinking about it. One day when he, w he, w he went on another mission trip here locally, he was, he was just racked by it, man. He wanted to go, but he, did, he couldn't stand getting on a plane. He, he was fearful about what would happen to him. As he was praying this one night, God actually came. He was surrounded by a group of guys who came to pray for him. Again, not focused on themselves. And uh, he, he forgot what had happened. We're, we're in the middle of praying for him. Uh, and and uh, he looks up at us and he's like, what are we praying for? He had completely forgotten the moment. Generosity in so many ways uh, cures our, our focus on ourselves. And, and I think it does this for three reasons, right? It's a selfless act. When we're generous with our time, when we're generous with what we possess, it's a selfless act that has eternal consequences. Jesus says that, that we, when we do generous things, we store an imperishable inheritance for ourselves, right? It takes the attention off me. When we're anxious, all we're thinking about is ourselves. It's also an act of faith in God's providence. It's, a, it's me saying that I trust God to provide for my needs. It's not about what I can do, what I can accomplish. I don't have to worry about what I have going on. And it's also an act of resistance to the relentless productivity our world demands. It's an act of resistance to saying it's all about what I can add and what I can do and what I, how I can serve myself. 
It, generosity cures our anxiety for those three reasons. So here's the, here's the rhythms I've set up in my life. I wanna give with joy. I wanna give first and I wanna give until it hurts. I wanna give with joy. I wanna give first and I wanna give until it hurts. And every month I wanna resource my church. My wife and I have made these commitments. We resource our church. We support a parachurch ministry and we, we wanna meet an individual need. I think there are so many ways to do this, but these are the rhythms that we've adopted in our life because we're so prone to forget about it. Right? We, wanna, we wanna do these things on a tangible level because generosity cures my anxiety. The other is this, uh, it's not just possessions, it's attention. Anxiety ceases when God has my attention. Generosity cures my anxiety, but here's the other thing. Anxiety ceases when God has my attention. We went on a hike a couple of weeks ago with my, with my kids. We were up in the mountains, uh, up above Netherland, and uh, it was a beautiful day. And then how many of you know, right over the mountains came this storm that caught us as we were walking back. And we don't walk fast because my three-year-old uh, is really slow and he hasn't quite gotten to the point where he likes hiking yet. Anybody have those three-year-olds? And so he's just taking his sweet time. And we got caught in this crazy storm, thunder, lightning, hail, and my kids are freaking out just freaking out, crying, oh, the, the whole gamut. And of course, as the dad, what do I do? I, uh, I, I, I just tell my wife, I'm like, let's just walk faster. We gotta get back to the car. And what do you think that did to my kids? Uh, we're just gonna try harder, man. Relentless productivity. We're gonna walk faster and faster. And my wife knew it was a bad idea, but the, it just made the crying worse. What did we have to do to get my kids to stop being scared, to stop being anxious? We had to shift their attention away from what was scary, away from what was fearful, away from what was going on, we had to help them to think about what was true and lovely and reliable. The only way to get them to stop crying because the storm wasn't stopping. And, and I wanna read some, some scripture verses to you. I just want you to close your eyes as, as the team comes back up. I wanna read these to you. When, when, scripture, when, when God gives us instruction as your eyes are closed, uh, as you think about this, when he tries to help us be free from worry, he always tells us to, to consider, to shift our mind. Isaiah 26 says, you keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Let's be fair to both genders. You keep her in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because she trusts in you. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 says this. It says, for the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. Philippians, the best one says this. Philippians chapter four says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer, and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things and the God of peace will be with you. If we want to be free from anxiety, you can open your eyes. It's because we will have started to pay attention to God. And this is so hard. Everything pulls our attention away from God. Just like we need rhythms of generosity. We need things that pin us down that we do every month, every week, every day. I believe we need rhythms of rest. Things that we have instituted in our lives. And I just wanna give, give you mine. My hope is this. I don't want you to view this as legalistic because I don't think God does. He gave us these things throughout scripture to live by and walk by because he knew how fickle and forgetful we are. And so here's my list. Uh, come up with your own. I hope you'll come up with your own this week. What are your rhythms of generosity? How do, you, how do you give God your attention? How do you focus your possessions on him so that your affections might change? Here's, here's mine. Every month I fast from food and tech. I, uh, we don't talk a lot about fasting, but I need a break from technology and from food to remind myself that Jesus is the bread of life and that my righteousness is found in, not in what I know, but in who I know. I just need that break. Um, maybe you're different. 
Every month I, I do it. It's not a legalistic thing for me. It's me reminding myself of, of who I am. Every week I take a Sabbath, or at least I try to take a Sabbath. Let's be honest, this is harder than it looks. I, I take a break from tech, from work, from, from the things that, that cause pressure in my life. Uh, I used to think that uh, this was an Old Testament thing, but I think Sabbaths are like gravity. I think it's just the world God designed because it's in his image and we need it. Every morning before I pick up my phone, I pick up my Bible. Every night I pray before my head hits the pillow and every anxious moment, I read those passages to you. We overcome anxiety by focusing our attention on what's good, honorable, true, lovely, right, and noble. That could be in nature, it could be birds, trees, it could be the unchanging, lovely character of God. It could be Jesus on the cross taking our place so that we can boldly approach God's throne of grace. Uh, but every anxious moment, we can revisit what's true. These are the rhythms that I need. And I hope as we sing a song called You Won't Let Go, as you go throughout your week this week, that you'll reflect on these rhythms so that God might bring you peace. And if you're in a, in a just a hard place right now, if, if you're struggling this week, uh, man, we would, we would love to pray for you. Come find me. Uh, uh, one, of our, one of our staff members, Julie, and she has no idea this is coming. I'm just doing the spur of the moment. So Julie will be in the back left corner. Uh, we would love to pray for you. Thank you, Julie, for, for being willing to do that. You are wonderful. If you're online, man, send us a message. We would love to join you in prayer in this difficult moment. Um, and would you stand with me as I close in prayer? Father, we love you and we, we thank you that, that you offer us freedom from the hamster wheel of relentless productivity and, and crushing anxiety, that you give us peace as we follow you. Lord, forgive us for our just fickle, forgetful hearts. And Lord, help us to in this moment see you more clearly, to turn from our practical atheism and to adopt rhythms of rest that lead us more to trust you and follow you each day. Give us intentionality and be honored as we sing these words in Jesus' name, amen.